While performing a routine code auditing, our team has discovered several vulnerabilities and end curses pres present on multiple operating systems. In this talk, we will discuss those vulnerabilities and the dangers they pose, as well as discuss open software, open source software security in general. Uh, JBL is from DEF CON Group 9723 in Tel Aviv, Israel. Uh, he is a principal security researcher at Microsoft working as the mic at the, nah, sorry, I, these instructions for my lips were in Chinese and I don't read Chinese. So <laughs> working as the Microsoft Defender Research Architect for cross-platform, Jonathan has rich experience in vulnerability research, exploitation, cryptanalysis, and offensive security in general. So welcome to the stage, JBO. All right, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Um, so uh, we can hear you. Awesome. For the folks that are in this room, uh, the physical room, just uh, try to keep it down because it's hard for me to. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, Giglio, let... this is the curse of end curses. Uh, Giglio, please uh, continue to the next slide. And I'm going to zoom in here. Okay, a bit about me. My name is Jonathan Borr, or JBO for short. My Twitter or X handle, uh, depending on your point of view and, and preferences, is yo 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 JBO. Uh, I write here and there stuff. Um, uh, I, as 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 X Ray mentioned, I'm a member of uh, nine uh, uh, nine seven two three, the Tel Aviv uh, Israeli one. But in the last six years, I've been uh, like I've relocated to the U.S. and I've been living in a suburb of Seattle. Um, uh, but that's that's pretty much about uh, about me. I'm a Microsoft Defender for Endpoint Research Architect that is focusing on stuff that usually do not run Windows, which is Linux, Mac OS, iOS, Android, Chrome OS, uh, IoT here and there, Windows here and there, especially you know in the last couple of years with. Uh, Windows having WSL, WSA, if you're unfamiliar, Windows can run Android. So everything is now a mishmash and you need to know everything to do everything. So that's what I'm trying to do. I have a mix of offensive and defensive security. I'm also like before having a kid, I used to have a lot of hobbies, but now my hobbies are sleeping and eating in that order. Um, I'm a husband, a father, a cat lover, and that's pretty much about me. Next slide, please. Um, I don't see the slide moving. Giglio? Okay, good. Um, uh, there is probably some lag. Um, uh, and this talk, this talk is, is uh, a research that we have done, uh, not just me, but a few other folks. The first folks here, Emmanuel, uh, Emmanuel Michael, uh, uh, Alexia, and Dan are uh, Microsoft uh, researchers. And interestingly enough, we also collaborated with Gergely Kalman, who I probably I probably butchered his name now. Uh, he's uh, not a Microsoft employee. We just reached out over Twitter, which or X, uh, which was pretty interesting. Uh, you know, in terms of collaboration between us and folks who are not Microsoft employees. So uh, shout outs to them. Next slide, please. Okay, how how did it really start? Like, what what is how did the, this research start? Uh, so if you're familiar a bit with POSIX or, or, or Linux or Mac, whatever, then you probably know about suite binaries. This is how sudo works. Basically, it has a flag in the file system that says uh, that says if um, uh, if 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 I have this flag, then uh, when, whenever someone runs me, it's going to run as my owner. Usually it's it's for root, right? Usually root would be the owner. And this is how suite binaries work. This is how you elevate privileges uh, legitimately in Linux and, and other POSIX file system, uh, other POSIX uh, operating systems. And uh, we were looking, or I was looking at uh, uh, Mac OS suite binaries because uh, Linux uh, suite binaries are, are very secure. They're not, but, uh, uh, but I mean, folks have been looking around and I mean, a lot has been found. And I was asking myself, well, does uh, Mac OS have the same kind of like uh, scrutiny? And uh, I don't think it does. So um, I started looking at Mac OS suite binaries and I noticed top is a suite binary. Now top, if you're unfamiliar with a utility, 
it's like a task manager for for like a QI, which is like the console UI kind of thing. It shows you all the tasks and everything. And it's very surprising to see that uh, top is a suite binary in in Mac OS, which is different from uh, top on Linux. Um, and uh, there are reasons for why it's a suite binary. Basically, it needs to get something on Mac OS that's called like a um, uh, a task port, which is the equivalent of a process handle in Windows, and you need like certain privileges and capabilities to do that in Mac. Um, in Linux, not so much. You just run ptrace and you're good. Or in, in, in Linux, it's actually different. You have procfs. In Mac, you don't have that. Um, and because of that, uh, Apple has basically changed how uh, top works. It still shows all the processes and whatnot, but it's met much less capable. Um, so they changed the code there and made it like uh, a suite binary, which is interesting. Um, and then I was like, OK, it doesn't, doesn't look like I can run child processes and stuff from, from top on Mac. But I was like, what, what are the dependencies that Top has? And I, uh, in the uh, screen here, in the uh, you know uh, bottom part, you can see uh, Top uh, is owned by Root. And it has, in the uh, privileges, you can see R-S and then R-S, X, R-X. And the S part in the R-S means that it's a suite binary, uh, meaning that if someone runs it, it will run as Root. Which, which is very interesting. If you run otool-l, which is the Mac OS um, uh, equivalent of uh, read elf uh, to basically parse uh, the macho files, uh, it will show you the dependencies. And if you can see one of the dependencies, say uh, there are many interesting dependencies here, including core foundation, which is a Mac OS thing. Um, and one of the dependencies, the third one specifically says lib n curses find 5.4. Now I started looking and I'm like, okay, Ncurses, like when when I started doing this research, Ncurses was at 6.4. So 5.4 is pretty pretty fucking old. Um, so so pretty interesting, um, you know, to look at that and see what we can achieve. Um, so that was the uh, I guess uh, incentive. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, what is Ncurses? What is that thing? Ncurses is an open source library dating back to 1993. So uh, pretty old. Uh, sorry for you, you all this uh, uh, online or in the room, but like 1993, in my opinion, is still still old. Uh, geez, 30 years ago. Um, and it's responsible for TUI handling, like terminal-based UI, uh, just like Top does. Um, it's uh, it's used by several bi uh, binaries on both Linux and Mac OS, and actually more operating systems. Uh, it's uh, coded in C, which is good and bad, um, depending on your uh, preference and point of view. And it has a very, very complex logic. Now, you might ask yourself, why why does it have a very complex logic? All it has to do is like print nice things on the screen, right? Um, so here's the thing. Ncursus is the successor uh, to Cursus, which happened in 1980, and Pcursus, which, which is another library that happened in 1982. And interestingly enough, it's maintained mostly by a single person who does not get any money out of it. Um, just like uh, uh, Log4j, for instance, who was maintained or still is maintained, I don't know, by three folks uh, in an open source fashion. So same thing, but only one person who is a real superhero, actually. Uh, if you uh, see the name Thomas E. Dickey, he is the maintainer of Ncurses. And he's the maintainer of other big projects. Uh, the biggest project that I've seen that he maintains is Lynx, which is a Again, another UI based, uh, in this case, browser. You can actually use a browser in your uh, terminal, uh, but you can't uh, do nice things with it, like log into DCGVR. So don't use that for, for that because there is no like video and stuff. Uh, but it's really interesting. Um, and his code is really, really interesting. Um, Thomas uh, is doing all of that without getting paid, as far as I know. Um, so uh, why is the logic really? that complex and 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 the reason for that is because terminals are really 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 complicated and hard next slide please um okay so if you remember if you're really really like into old stuff or or you know you've been around you remember the old days when terminals were actual terminals like these days if you have a terminal it's a pseudo terminal 
uh, it's not a real terminal. I'm talking about like a physical thing, right? And terminals are complicated because they have different makers. They have different capabilities. For instance, uh, I mean, can you do a backspace, right? You can imagine that those terminals are like teletype and stuff like that, where you can't obviously do a backspace. Some of them didn't support colors and so on and so forth, right? So there are many different uh, makers, different terminals. And of course, there, there is no like a uniform standard for anything because it's, it's the 90, 1980s and everyone, you know, basically had no standards. Well, just like today, but, but I mean, less like today. Um, so the question is, how can you be, if, you, if you're going to write a curses library and curses library, how can you be terminal independent, right? Because you have like, it, it doesn't make sense to write code to each and every terminal. So what, what was done is basically to have something called a terminal info database. And that thing kind of specifies the capabilities of different terminals. So a terminal of maker X can support backspace or terminal of, uh, of uh, maker Y uh, has uh, 25 uh, columns and 80 rows or, or uh, the other way around. Um, so that, that's, that's the motivation. Um, so those uh, terminal info database files uh, can be viewed with the info CMP command. Uh, that's both on Linux and Mac. And I think most POSIX systems uh, have, has the, have this kind of tool. Um, and uh, interestingly enough, in, uh, terminal info databases uh, are an advanced version of a really old format called uh, TermCap, uh, which uh, is a 16-bit thing. It's, it's, as you can probably imagine from 16-bit, it's really old and I won't be discussing it here. It's, it's rarely used these days by anyone. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is an example of me running info CMP. The dash one basically is not interesting. It just means that it's going to like show one uh, line by line. Um, it doesn't really matter. And I just so show the first 10 because there are tons of them. Uh, as you can see, this is like, this basically translates the current, in this case, uh, 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 terminal info file into a textual format. I'm kind of hinting right now that the terminal info files are really binary files, which they are. Uh, and so the first part is a remark that says reconstructed via info CMP from file whatever. And you can see here the name of the file. This is the term info database uh, file that is being used uh, for the current uh, pseudo terminal, which is X term in this case. And then you can see a bunch of letters which look weird, like AM, BCE, CCC, KM, and so on. And some of them look like swear words, but they're like most of them are not. Um, if you run the file command on the terminal info file, you can see that it says, a uh, compiled 32-bit term info entry, whatever, which is really interesting. It's compiled, it's binary, um, and so on. So, so, so very juicy things, in my opinion, at least. Next slide, please. There is a major lag between uh, Giglio hitting the back, hitting the space, and me seeing the thing, but it's fine. Um, so what are the, what are what are the capabilities like this AM and whatnot that you've seen are basically capabilities of the terminal, uh, and apparently there are three types of capabilities. There are boolean capabilities, numeric ones, and string ones. So boolean uh, capabilities are basically there or they're not there. For instance, we've seen AM. AM basically means uh, whether the terminal supports something called automatic margins, which I don't care a lot about, but that's a thing. Um, numeric ones basically mention uh, uh, numeric values. Um, for instance, calls uh, uh, pound 80 means that the terminal supports 80 columns. That's the meaning of calls pound 80. And you can you can uh, you can uh, differentiate, of course, the uh, different capabil types of capabilities based on uh, how they're represented in info CMP. Boolean ones will just have the boolean the name or not. Uh, numeric ones will have the name and then a pound, uh, which which is the uniform, yeah, like universal sign of a number and then a number. And then the string ones will have a, a, uh, an, an equal sign. In this case, I, I show you clear equals uh, uh, slash E and then bracket H. And this looks like another swear word. And these are really the control characters for cleaning the screen, which uh, which, which is really interesting. And this is this is how you basically are uh, going to be um, um, terminal agnostic. You basically are going to use those term info files to uh, send, send certain uh, control characters, or you can list know that you support the 
certain amount of columns or Boolean values and so on. Uh, so I, I hope the motivation is clear. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, that's good. Uh, string capabilities, like out of these three, if you were looking for vulnerabilities, obviously you would look at string capabilities. Why? Because they have like the most amount of input. More input equals more vulnerabilities generally. Um, string capabilities are complex because they might hold more than simple string literals. Apparently they support something which is, uh, which are stack based operations on uh, parameters, which sounds very, very juicy. Uh, eventually I discovered, and I can show you, I will show you later that string capabilities are just like programming. They're not Turing complete, but they're very, very close to it, which is really interesting. For example, um, string capabilities are used if you want to uh, move your cursor. If you want to move your cursor from, let's say, the current position to, I don't know, five, seven, then uh, end cursors will use mvcur command, uh, uh, the mvcur capability, really, which ultimately uses a cap capability with the x and y sent as parameters. So it's pretty interesting. The term info files, uh, um, the string capabilities, at least in them, can get parameters from, from the program, in this case, n curses, right? So n curses send, sends uh, as the first parameter, let's say five or the x coordinate, and the second uh, uh, parameter, the y coordinate, um, and uses the cap capability, which will use those parameters on a stack, which is not really a stack. I'll show you how it looks like. Uh, to send, eventually send some control characters or do something. Um, uh, and that's pretty much it. The capability interpre interpreter is, is, is really some sort of bizarre programming language. That's pretty much what I said. Next slide, please. Um, all right. Still waiting for it to be loaded. Man. So these are the uh, stack-based string capabilities. This is not a complete list, uh, but this is these are just a part of the things that you can do, right? If you if you write your own term info uh, database file, obviously. So for instance, you can do uh, um, a percent and then a number between brackets, which which will push the literal number to the stack. You can use the uh, p1 until p9, um, uh, which are the parameters that were being sent. If you remember. Uh, the moving your cursor thing, that's pretty much it. And it will use P1 and P2 as parameters. Uh, you can add, uh, 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 subtract, multiply, divide, or take <clears throat> take a modulus, sorry, uh, to perform arithmetic operations on, on, on numbers. Basically, what it does is to pop two numbers from the stack, calculate something, and then push it back, which is really interesting. Uh, you can do the same thing with uh, uh, comparison operations, like are those equal? Is this less than or bigger than? And you can even do a bitwise n and a bitwise or um, uh, and push the result back to that stack. Uh, you can pop a string from the stack and push the string length back to the stack. You can even have conditions, which is extremely interesting and useful uh, if, if you are into programming even, uh, which you can basically write a condition and then a, but and then a body and then another body. In this case, it's like a question mark condition and then uh, a, a percent T, which stands for then, and then a body, and then percent E, which is for else. The else part is actually non-mandatory. Um, besides that, you can pop a string from the stack and print it to the screen with percent S or percent C, just like you do in a printf, let's say. And uh, you can do that with numbers too, with percent D and percent X. Again, just uh, uh, printf or scanf style. So there are a lot of different interesting string capabilities that you can use as an attacker or someone who writes like a term info file if you're really unlucky and you know you chose the wrong profession in the world. Uh, next slide, please. Um, why do I care? Uh, so some interesting motivation. Um, uh, this is from uh, the man page. The, the man page is extremely long for term info uh, and um, uh, one of the things that I noticed is that it says, um, and, and th that's in red, if there is an environment variable called term info, then basically the, the, the path name is going to be used from that environment variable instead of using the, uh, the, the correct uh, term info database path, right? So I can basically, if, if you think about it, I can really create uh, a, or poison a new database info file, which is really juicy if it's going to be used by a suite binary. 
right? So that, that's the motivation. Even if that environment variable is not set, and curses will actually look at uh, at your home pa um, uh, home directory and then a dot term info uh, directory, which you can plant like plenty of uh, term info files there. Only after it didn't find the environment variable and didn't find the term info directory will it actually. Uh, uh, there is another environment variable called term info tears, and if all of them like are not there, then it then it has basically uh, a way to like a search order. Um, in other paths, the, the legitimate paths, let's call it like that. So this is the motivation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this is how it looks like uh, a, a little fun experiment if you if, if you care about those things. Uh, this is an example of environment variable poisoning to do something fun. I use info cmp-1, I remove uh, uh, the clear command and write it to a file called cur, which is just a file, it's a text file. I add a new line in there that basically says clear equals lol hacks and then a, a, a line break uh, and add it to cur. This basically means that instead instead of sending like the control characters for cleaning the screen, I can do something else. Then I use a, a tool called tick, which is the terminal if info compiler. That's what tick stands for. Uh, it's really funny, actually. They have uh, three tool names, tick, tack, and toe. I don't know why. Um, uh, and you can do dash o uh, on cur and uh, dash o on the current directory and then cur. And then I can show you the files. I use ls dash la. And you see that next to cur, there is a new directory called 78. Uh, on Linux, it will look a bit different. It will create probably a, a like the first name in the uh, term info uh, in the um, uh, pseudo terminal name. So probably starts with an x for x term or something. Uh, but it's the same concept. Now, if I use term info equals the current directory in open sh, it will use that my term info file instead of the normal term info file. And when I try to clear the screen with clear, it doesn't clear the screen, it just writes lol hacks, which is the which is like really interesting if you want to like mess around with those things. Uh, next slide. Um, and environment variable poisoning can even be done uh, more interesting. You can, if you remember, again, I mentioned that top is a suit binary in Mac. Well, in this case, I created something interesting. Uh, I created a, you know, kind of like a, a, a malformed uh, term info file. And um, and then if I do term info equals uh, a current directory in run top, it actually poisons the environment variables used by top, which is a suit binary, and I cause a segmentation fault or a crash, in other words. Causing a crash in a suit binary is really, really dangerous because it means that you can do like memory corruption on a suit binary, um, which kind of hints that you can achieve an elevation of privilege, which we eventually have. So that's pretty good. Uh, suit binaries that are not sanitizing the environment are extremely dangerous, and that's a classic uh, local privilege escalation potential. Like if you look around, in, even this year, I think, you can find on Linux uh, several uh, suite binaries that uh, you know uh, did not sanitize their environment well, environment variables well, and you know folks were able to achieve uh, local critical escalation. Next slide. Um, so my question was: Is macOS outdated? If you remember, uh, Ncurses um, macOS uses Ncurses 5.4, and the current Ncurses is still 6.4. So, like one major version above. Um, so interestingly, there have been some public NCURSIS vulnerabilities before. We're not the first ones to find uh, vulnerabilities in NCURSIS. And Apple uses the old NCURSIS, again, 5.4, but applies security patches. And you can find that uh, in the Apple OSS distributions, uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub repo under NCURSIS. You can see them actually applying the patches, which is really interesting. I don't know why they insist on staying with 5.4 and not taking the latest and greatest. Pro probably or poss possibly because they don't want to retest everything. Testing is very hard. That's my only suspicion. I don't know. I never asked and they never told me anything. Um, so uh, we tried a bunch of public vulnerabilities and it, they did not affect the NCURSIS on Mac OS. And that means that we got to find some fresh ones then. And we started by fuzzing and code auditing. Uh, next slide. Awesome. So. Fuzzing is really, really good when it comes to file parsing and uh, packet parsing. This is like the bread and butter of fuzzing. 
So uh, terminal info files are binary files. There is heavy C parsing, and that means memory corruptions. We've all already been able to demonstrate one. So, uh, uh, so the obvious candidate for fuzzing is the file parsing part. Uh, we started by fuzzing with AFL++. AFL++ is not awesome when it comes to macOS. It's extremely slow. And while we were fuzzing, I started like, uh, you know, taunting uh, uh, online in Twitter when it was still called Twitter uh, that, hey, we're fuzzing and curses. And then Gergely Kalman like approached and said, oh, uh, uh, I have, have a fuzzer that he wrote from scratch and some crash cases too. So he basically gave them to us. And I was like, oh, thank you, sir. Uh, so, I mean, I owe Gergely at least a beer. Um, this is not a fuzzing talk. We won't go into details. And his crashes were all uh, rooted in the same issue. Um, and we wrote our own fuzzer uh, as well. So while consuming electricity and melting the planet, we also, you know, looked at some of the crash cases and also did like code auditing at the same time um, uh, uh, by hand because there are some things that fuzzers don't find so for some reasons. Next slide. Uh, discovery number one, that's uh, probably a, a really good discovery and it's a heap out of bound write. Um, the function that parses term info files uh, fills a structure with different capabilities, uh, the three types. So it'll have like a, a structure with Boolean types and then the numeric types and then the string uh, types for the types of capabilities. Um, and after those in the memory, there is room for something called an extend, extended capabilities, uh, capabilities, which can also come in three types, Boolean, numeric, and strings. The reason for extended capabilities is that if you wanted to add capabilities that are not standardized, and again, there is no standard, but, but I mean, let's imagine that there is one, there is a de facto standard for what it's worth. Uh, so you can add those things. Like you can write JBO equals cool or, or whatever you want to do, right? Um, uh, so those are extended capabilities. and Specifically, if there are extended strings, a certain memory region is, is being reallocated literally with the realloc uh, C uh, function. And uh, the, uh, that reallocation might actually be reallocated to something smaller than the number of extended strings, uh, 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 the number of non-extended strings. So if the number of extended strings is large and the number of regular strings is small, then uh, we're going to have an out of bound write. And I'll show that uh, in the next slide. Thank you. That's that's the issue here. Uh, you can see uh, in this case, uh, PTR is basically the struct that I was talking about, and uh, strings is the member there. And you can see that there is a, a, an alloc here, uh, basically a calloc. That that's a malloc that uh, zeroes out the like returned uh, chunk. Uh, with uh, with a maximum between str count, which is uh, 414 bytes, if I remember correctly, and little str count, which which is the real number of the string count. Now, next slide, please. And this is where where things go a bit crazy. Um, the number of strings, if there are if there are any extended uh, strings, the number uh, current number of strings is basically that uh, maximum number, which is 414 plus the number of extended string counts. And then uh, you can see a realloc of, uh, I probably the thing is a, a bit skewed, the, the, uh, the um, other red, uh, red box should be around PTR strings. So in line 278, uh, where you see a realloc of the number of strings. And that realloc is problematic because usually when you realloc, you want to realloc to something larger, not something smaller. Because we're reallocating to something smaller, then, de then dereferencing a standard string can actually lead to out of bounds right in the heap. That's the idea. Next slide. Uh, that was discovery number one. Discovery number two is even more severe. Uh, it's a design issue that we that we discovered um, just by code auditing. Um, the function tparm, which simulates the stack-based string operations does not know how many parameters it expects. If you remember, the string capabilities can actually get parameters between P1 and P9, right? And what it does is to uh, to basically push those things to that fake stack, right? As I said, it's all stack-based capabilities. Uh, it's a very edric function like printf, so it gets a, a, a non-defined number of parameters. The way that a very edric function works is that 
he doesn't know. It basically uh, pushes all the uh, all the parameters that were um, that were, were giving to it, and then it is the in this case printf's responsibility to know how many uh, uh, parameters to pull from the stack. The same thing happens with tparm, which is a part of incurses. The issue here is that it doesn't know how many parameters to pull. In printf, printf does it by actually looking at the number of uh, of, uh, uh, of formats. So for instance, if you do printf percent d uh, percent s, it knows to pull two parameters from the stack because there are two parameters that it expects. In tparm, what it does is to look at the maximum number of, uh, of parameter that are, is being used by the string capability. So for instance, if you have uh, the maximum number is uh, percent p7, then it, will, it knows how to pull uh, seven uh, parameters from the stack. And that's kind of like an information leak straight from the stack. If you have a capability that expects only uh, percent p1, and you make it use you make it use all the way until percent p9, again the function doesn't know how many parameters to like to, to expect, so it basically pulls stuff from the stack without any control. And you can get to pop eight um, eight different values from the stack and use them in various ways. Uh, percent x is my favorite uh, way. Uh, I'll show you a demo, uh, not a real demo, but a, a, a screenshot in the next slide. So next slide, please. Um, this is an example um, of, uh, of uh, 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 the capability CUP cup, which is used somewhere when moving the, uh, moving the cursor. And uh, normally it expects, I think, one or two parameters. But in this case, what I've done is to overwrite cup equals leak and then percent p1 percent x. What it does is to push the first parameter and then pop it and print it to the screen hexadecimally, right? Same thing with p2, p3 until p9, right? So basically what I do is to pull stuff from the stack and print it to the screen. And when I run top with that, you can see that it says leak and then a bunch of uh, different values. Those values are uh, values that are pulled from the stack. And this is pretty interesting, not only as an info leak, you know, like a, basically if there is something interesting on a stack, like, you know, credentials and stuff, you can pull it, but also because it actually defeats ASLR, right? ASLR, if you're unfamiliar, is a, a, a defense in depth mitigation that randomizes, um, randomizes where libraries are loaded in Linux. And it, in Linux, it's pretty strong in Mac OS, not so much, but, um, but the idea is that, uh, to defeat ASLR, you basically need to leak information about a uh, about a certain li uh, location of a library. And in this case, some of these uh, values, specifically P4, in this case, is uh, we discovered that it was an actual address uh, somewhere in a in a fixed offset from the uh, from the base of uh, a certain module that is loaded to top. So this is a way to defeat ASLR and start building a rob chain if you're familiar with the subject. So that's pretty cool. Next slide. Um, the third issue was a type confusion. If you noticed, uh, we have uh, parameters again, right? Uh, like P1 until P9. The stack-based string capabilities, uh, 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 that, that's something uh, really interesting. The stack-based uh, uh, stack string capabilities are not really stack-based. They're really heap-based. And what happens is that the, there is an array on the heap with 20 frames and the top of the stack index, right? So they didn't really use a stack. They like pull stuff from the stack if they need to the actual stack, but then push it to like this fake data structure, which they call a stack. Uh, and each frame has uh, a type, which is either string or numeric and a place for data. As you can see here uh, in, this, uh, in the uh, screenshot that I gave you, um, you can see how a stack frame looks like. The first uh, union there, uh, data actually contains the data. The data can be either numeric 32 bits uh, 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 signed integer, which is called num, or it can be uh, a, a pointer to, uh, to a string uh, car pointer, right? And that's data. And the num type is basically uh, the kind of the type. If that Boolean is true, it means it's numeric. Otherwise, it's a string, cap a string uh, data. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so 
for numerical string specific operations, you already know what type you're expecting and what you get. For instance, if you uh, if you use percent plus to add two values, you know that you're expecting to pull two numeric values from the stack and push one numeric value back to the stack. So that's pretty clear. If you use percent s, you know that you're expecting to pull a string from the uh, uh, from the stack uh, and print it to the screen, right? So the question is, what happens to parameters like percent p1, percent p2, and so on? There are certain certain capabilities like uh, the uh, cursor moving part that are really uh, expecting numeric values, but there are certain capabilities that expect string uh, string parameters, and there is no way to know. So apparently, what ncurses does is heuristically conclude the parameter type based on the static scan of the capability. So for instance, if you get a percent p1 percent s it kind of says oh i see a percent s and that means that the last value that was pushed uh which was percent p1 is a string that's how it concludes it if you do percent p1 percent x on the other hand or percent b it knows oh i'm expecting after the thing before percent x in this case to be a numeric parameter not a string parameter so i i associate p1 with a number and then if you remember one of the cool things uh, that uh, we've done or we've described is conditions. Now, the thing about conditions is that they can be true or not true and they're resolved dynamically. So heuristically, you can't really conclude anything. Mm -hmm. So what happens if you do percent question mark P1? That means basically if P1 is equal, it is not equal to zero and then, uh, and then uh, use P1 as a numeric value Otherwise, use P1 as a string value. The heuristic here, like, obviously fails because P1 can't be both numeric and string. But you can make basically the heuristic thing uh, uh, think whatever whatever you want it to think. You can make the uh, heuristic check in n curses think that P1 is a, is a number or P1 is a string as you wish, right? Because of those conditions that can or can't really happen. Um, next uh, next slide, please. Using the type confusion uh, capability or, or a type confusion like uh, uh, attack that I've shown basically how to fool the heuristic check, uh, you can basically make uh, make certain capabilities uh, make certain uh, capabilities behave very weird. For instance, um, in this case, what I've done is to uh, show caps equals percent p one percent s. Caps really expects uh, the uh, the parameter to be uh, in num numeric value and not a string value, but because I poisoned the term info file, I make it think that cup is really uh, a string value. What happens then is that, um, and I, I attach a debugger here, which is LLDB. If, I mean, if you're coming from a Linux world, you can imagine it's a GDB net, just not as good. Um, and what I've done here is just to show you a, an interesting crash where basically uh, I run the thing and then you can get uh, bad access and then you can see the address being uh, 10, there is, or hex of 10, really, which is 16. The reason for that is because uh, P1, which had the value uh, 10, because it was pushed on the stack as, as, as a numeric value, is being treated as a string. So what really happens is that top, in this case, tries to read from address 10, right? And this is basically like a, an out-of-bounds read to an arbitrary address, because you can actually control where the cursor moves if you control top. So I can make a uh, top read a treat as a string to any uh, address, which is really a great capability. Um, uh, so that, that's the discovery number three. Next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, we dis we um, discover we had other discoveries too. For instance, we discovered the, uh, the referencing of address minus one always which is not really interesting, just a denial of service, you can crash whatever. And the other minor uh, denial of service crashes, uh, what Gurgly has discovered, by the way, was the, the reference of address minus one, but still pretty cool. Um, and what we discovered is that it's possible to combine everything that we found to get a local privilege escalation on Mac, right? Um, so that, that's pretty severe. Disclosure was done to Thomas E. Dickey, and it's really interesting because like there is no standardization to those things. Like if you find a bag a bug in Mac OS, you report to Apple, right? If you find a bag in um, in the Linux kernel, you report to uh, 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 you report to uh, kernel.org, 
or um, directly to Linus. Uh, but in this case, it's like a third, you know, a third, uh, a third party library, if you will, that is being used in Mac OS and Linux and actually OpenBSD and other operating systems as well. So all of the uh, memory corruption issues that we found actually affect all of those operating systems uh, to uh, different degrees and severities. Uh, so that's pretty cool. So we disclosed both to Thomas E. Dickey, that's the first person that we disclosed to, and to Apple, and to OSS Security, and the Free Software Foundation, and the police, and the FBI, and whatnot, um, and to major Linux distributions like Arch, uh, Arch Linux, our, uh, Red Hat, Canonical, etc. You've got the CVE 2023 29491. Really, there should be like like a tens, I think, of CVEs here. But we, you know, CVEs are not trophies. We don't really care how many CVEs we get. So we were like, just just want to like track the issue for like very very obvious purposes. So uh, that CV basically says on like multiple corruptions in N cursors or something like that. Um, fixes are not easy. The fixes are easy. For instance, for the heap. Uh, the heap corruption vulnerability, the realloc thing that I've shown you, but some of the design issues uh, are really hard to fix. Like, how, how do you know how many parameters to really get? Or the heuristic check is something that you can't really do when you do a static scan of a of, of a string because of those conditions, for instance. So it really complicates things. And uh, Thomas E. Dickey worked really hard on getting it fixed, I think in a week and a half, which is really impressive. Um, so huge thanks to Thomas and pushing like the patches and everything. Um, next slide. Um, I did want to mention that I don't drop zero days by by uh, by definition. Just a week ago, so there was a chance that I'll have to censor some of these slides, but I, I ended up not doing that because I'm very happy to say that um, those issue issues are not just fixed in end curses. Uh, they went upstream in Linux, and uh, they're also fixed just a week ago by Apple. So that's pretty good to know. Uh, it took them a while to actually get those fixed, even though it's just, you know, normally they would just take like the latest version of n curses, but because probably because of what they do with n curses 5.4, they had to apply the patches and then probably have a lot of folks just testing stuff, which is not fun. Uh, so uh, shout out to them as well. Um, and my conclusion or, or personal conclusion, and I hope it resonates well with you guys, is that uh, the state of open source software and third party libraries is kind of insane. It's just like a log4j when you had, again, three folks that were just maintaining stuff, not getting paid at all, and everyone was using it. The same thing happens here. Like Apple is using that, Linux is using that, and uh, you know, Linux is not for money, but but there are like Red Hat, for instance, actually makes money, right? So all of these guys use, use just one dude maintaining a library uh, 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 somewhere in his house or whatnot, and it's used across different operating systems in, in many different scenarios. Uh, uh, and I don't know, it, it reminded, reminded me at least of Log4j, not to that scale. It's not like remote code execution and the entire world collapses, um, but still pretty bad. Uh, if you're ever coding a suit binary, which you shouldn't, but if you are, drop your entire environment. And even if you do, Notice here that even if you drop your entire environment, you can still plant like a dot term info directory in your home, uh, in your home, uh, 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 like your home directory, which is still not great. Um, uh, so, like, be aware of those things. Be aware of the environment that you're importing, and and be aware of the dependencies that you have because it's very hard sometimes to know. Like, you're importing a st static or dynamic library. What are the implications? Sometimes it's not very clear, uh, and there are security implications to that. And um, update your systems. Like if you're using Mac or Linux or whatnot, keep those your system up to date, obviously. Uh, next slide. And I think you guys can get 13 minutes back, uh, unless there are questions. I will be taking questions. If I can zoom out here, I don't know how to zoom out. Let me turn around to the virtual audience. Silence is acceptance. <laughs> and any any questions from the room? Okay, everyone, everyone, 
either got got like all the technical details or got nothing. Either way, I'm happy. Thank you so much. Have a good one. Well, thank you, JBO, for.